Hello and welcome to the CNBC Africa special with me, Arnold Segoa. Now, in 2016, Rwanda maintained the key repo rate at 6.5% to ensure that the banking sector continues to finance economic activities while in limiting inflationary pressures from the monetary stance and the monetary sector. With this move, the total authorized loans to the private sector increased by 6.3% in 2016, while the broad money also increased by 7.5%. In retrospect, however, this is a drop from the 2015 private sector loan approvals that did stand at 13.6%. So how can Rwanda's monetary policy be utilized to spur more private sector growth in 2018? For a broader outlook on the monetary policy stance going forward, I got a chance to speak to the National Bank of Rwanda's governor, that is Governor John Rangomba. I think we had the worst more than 20 years for, for the for the region in uh, 2016, and even for Rwanda, 5.9, I think, was the lowest we've uh, recorded for quite some time. And as, as you heard from different reports, it was mainly linked to uh, unfavorable uh, trade conditions with uh, the international world because of the commodity prices that had more or less crashed. In the, we had issues of uh, drought in some regions, especially the East African region. 2017, a bit, we still recover, but still slow. As Again, as you saw, the first half of this year here hasn't been that good in terms of the economy. But in terms of the, the currency, the stability of the currency, because of the recovery in commodity prices uh, globally, we saw our import bill going up. At least we, I mean, our export uh, earnings uh, going up by almost 45% in the first uh, eight months. And uh, that was coupled with reduction in the import bill. Uh, so we, because of that, we saw stability on the, on the foreign exchange market. And uh, by end of August, we were at uh, 2.2. In fact, end of, uh, end of September, we were at 2.2% uh, depreciation. And as we had said earlier, we don't expect this to exceed 3% by, by the end of the year. And I think that's the lowest we've had for more than almost five years now. Right. Uh, 2016, arguably one of the best uh, things that did come out of it was uh, a very interesting campaign, which is uh, the Made in Rwanda campaign. And uh, this, of course, uh, playing into uh, the, the Ministry of Finance and, of course, the, the Central Bank has a very big hand in this. In the grand scheme of things, to what extent do we see the uh, Made in Rwanda campaign actually easing the pressure on the Rwandan franc. As you have mentioned, uh, we are seeing exports going up already and ultimately on the balance of our payment policy position. To what extent can we attribute this to uh, the Made in Rwanda campaign? I think that is seen mainly on the, on the import bill, uh, especially in the construction materials and specifically cement. The, our, our imports of cement drastically went down over the last two years because of uh, increased production of cement with our uh, cement producer. We haven't seen much uh, increase in exports of domestically uh, produced goods, though it's been going up as well. In fact, as we explained in the last uh, monetary policy and financial stability statement, the, 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 the diversification of our exports today is, uh, we used to have what we call traditional exports, uh, taking more than 70% of our total export earnings. That is coffee, tea, and minerals. And uh, this has gone down to almost at 7% by last year. So the other exports, including some industrial products like uh, meal products, like even the cement we are saying, that has been going up as well. Somehow attributed to, to Made in Rwanda uh, campaign. But as I say, this is something that has been going on for less than two years now. So the, there's a lot of going on, but still really in the infant phase. So we expect to, to see bigger results from this campaign in the next three years uh, for now.
Uh, something very interesting uh, from the last uh, monetary policy and financial stability uh, uh, presentation that you made was uh, the, the capital account. Uh, now, capital goods, rather not not capital account, but the capital goods actually diminishing. The the rate at which the country is importing uh, capital goods going down uh, on year on year. If we were to look at it for the past two years, uh, for a country like uh, Rwanda that is positioning itself to be a hub for East and Central Africa, wouldn't that be contrary to uh, the direction that the country is? actually taking and also achieving middle income status? I, I think we, we saw two main uh, reasons behind the, the reduction we saw last time. One was the best at which we are uh, comparing this growth for this year. I think there are big imports of capital goods in the last two years, uh, one mainly on transport uh, and machinery. Uh, so because of the, the size of the best, the increase wasn't that uh, really big. The other was on uh, re-exports. Most of our re-exports have been in capital goods in machinery and heavy trucks, especially to Burundi. So they, as if you look at our re-exports, that was also uh, affected, slowed down. So the slowing down in re-exports automatically uh, slowed down the imports of some of these goods that we've been re-exporting to, to our neighboring countries. And uh, as you know, Burundi has political problems, so the economy has been uh, slowing down, so they are not really importing these things from Rwanda. So it was mainly because of these two things. It doesn't really mean that there's big slowdown of uh, the requirements of these capital goods in the market, but that we had had big imports in the past, in the last two years, so that affected the, the growth within this year. Uh, uh, I think let's go back to uh, the, the core function here of the central bank uh, monetary policy. And uh, up to, uh, we did see some easing uh, by uh, close to 0 0.25 from uh, 6.25 to uh, 6.0. And uh, ultimately, in uh, the next uh, maybe six months, how do, we do what, what, what direction are we looking at maybe? I know this is a question you hear very, very <laughs> Yes, yeah, a question I hear very often and it's a question I don't have a straight for the answer. <laughs> because uh, these are things determined by the monetary policy as and when it sits. But, but if you remember the, 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 the last time we, we met the media in September after monetary policy committee, we, we expressed that we see uh, favorable conditions, especially on the inflationary side. We didn't expect to have any inflationary pressures, at least in, by the end of this year, and so it will depend on what happens. Uh, by beginning of next year, and uh, I think we were confident enough to state that we remain accommodative. How accommodative? That will depend on the technical work that is done as we prepare for the MPC. So we don't expect to tighten. Uh, so the worst we can do, or the, the yes, let me call it the, the least we can do, is remain at 6% where we are. But depending on the conditions, so that will determine. So we don't expect any tightening, but at least by December. I can't state for much by now because it depends. Uh, almost always our inflation is pushed up by food prices. The weather is a bit uh, uh, confusing at the moment, so we don't know what will happen by end of the year, uh, season A 2018. So that will determine what happens for the first quarter going forward but we expect to remain uh, accommodative. If, if we were to look at uh, the uh, headline inflation vis-a-vis -vis, uh, core inflation, and of course we do know this, uh, it does take into account the, the usual volatility of maybe food prices and fuel. Uh, if uh, 2016, well, if we even go back to 2015, uh, oil has been hovering below $50 a barrel. If at all the volatility of oil away from the food prices is, is uh, put into this equation. Why aren't we seeing uh, inflation maybe uh, more subdued, if at all, uh, uh, oil has been below uh, the $50 barrel mark? You know, food, I think, takes 28% of our basket. So it has a big role in, in our CPI, in our CPI. inflation. <coughs> so any movement on food prices affects, directly affects our, our inflation. Yeah, 8.2% compared to the challenges we had with food prices during the course of uh, 16 to uh, early 17, maybe if we had fear kicking in, would have been in double digits. So the fact that we remained really in single digits, one can say it was subdued, compared to the f pressures we had on the food market. So, uh, and we, 
we are happy that at least we had that that room to to maneuver just based on food prices, and we hope we won't see fuel kicking in and adding to the problem of food prices. But th that's the reality. So we, and we are happy that as food uh, production improved this year, we all immediately saw inflation going down. Honorable Governor, with the the central bank rate right now, the key repo rate at uh, just about six, just about uh, six percent. One might argue that uh, maybe Rwanda within East Africa is uh, uh, having the cheapest money right now. Why isn't this being reflected at least uh, for, for the commercial banks? I th I'm sure this is a question you hear countless times, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, where do you find this middle ground? Do you go the side that Kenya went and maybe have a cap? How do you spar the commercial banks to actually lend more? Maybe the issue is not lending more because they've been lending more in the past, but at higher rates. Uh, I think the issue has been consistently uh, high rates. And as I already said, high rates is also uh, depending on what you are basing on. So, but yes, as you say, uh, the key repo rate of 6% and average lending rate of 17%, uh, uh, yeah, one would, if you want to take that gap, it's big. It is. But there are many factors that uh, lead to or determine this lending rate. And uh, so one of them, of course, is the cost of the money that they use in their business, where today average deposit rates always oscillates between like 8.7 to 9. So it's around 9%. Then when you put in issues of, in fact, the biggest problem is issues of cost. The, the efficiency within the industry is still uh, not really as good as you could see in Kenya because Kenya is a developed market and uh, they have invested in systems, in uh, skills, and so the, the cost there, the cost of doing banking business in Kenya compared to the cost of doing banking business here is completely different. But we think we can do better. Uh, we can do better so we the signals we, we keep giving vis-a-vis -vis the, the, the the policy rate that we set is, in a way, at least it doesn't, like, like for example, we saw inflation going up from almost 2% to 8%, but we didn't see lending rates going up normally. The lending rate should have followed the inflation rate because financial assets are easily eaten up by inflation, but it didn't. So the, the fact that it has been constant for more than, uh, almost since uh, 2011, uh, the, the lending rates, also show there are many other factors that really determine this month necessarily the, the policy rate from the, the central bank. And as we said before, what we are doing, engaging with the banks, is really looking at this side of uh, the cost, the cost efficiency, the non-performing loans linked, cost linked to that. And I think that's how, at the end of the day, we'll be able to bring down the, the lending rate. And of course, competition, yes, we've had many banks coming in, but competition I don't think is yet healthy to the extent of influencing the pricing. Right. Uh, well, one of the, of course, indicators for um, a nominal GDP growth has to be broad money. Now, between uh, December 2016 and uh, June 2017, we did see broad money expand by close to 11%. Very, very stellar performance, if you ask me. Uh, if at all, there's that much money actually expanding in, well, broad money as it is. Uh, is this a sign of a liftoff in the grand scheme of things? Is this about to be reflected maybe in uh, the second quarter or even the first quarter of 2018? It is a good sign. It's a positive sign in terms of the performance of the economy itself. So monetary aggregates really give signs of what the economy would look like. But it also depends on other factors. And as well, say agriculture is the key player here. As we always do, we, we, we give the what we call the composite index of economic activities, but that excludes agriculture. And so we've seen that really going up since the beginning of the year, and that normally shows that we expect to see the real economy also uh, improving since the beginning of the year. And we had expected, as we said in the last monetary uh, policy committee uh, press conference, that Q2 would be better than Q1, but we're still lower than Q2 of last year. Uh, and again, we expect to see Q3 performing better than maybe Q2 uh, of this year. So we expect to see uh, improvement compared to what we had at the beginning of this year. 
might not go to the level of last year, but yes, much better than the first half of this year. If we were to go back to a, a, a credit to the private sector, we're looking at it at around 8.3%, uh, at least for the first half of uh, 2017. Uh, going forward, uh, if at all the deposits, because that's the other thing that is uh, quite disturbing, the deposits are actually de declining. Uh, what could be the issue here, at, at least from your end? I think that the deposits are not declining as such. The deposits may be growing slower than we had last year. I think when you look at our numbers, I think the deposits were also growing, uh, though slightly lower than what we had last year. But, but the, the important thing to note here is that the banks are already sitting on good liquidity. So any improvement, any increase in, in the depots is already increasing on, on already health uh, state of affairs vis-a-vis -vis the, the liquidity levels of our bank. So they don't have any problem in terms of lending uh, linked to liquidity. If anything, as we said earlier again, the slowdown this year has been linked to mainly two uh, factors. Uh, the, the loan application levels slowed down also, uh, so the demand side impacted the level of uh, approvals. But also because of the increasing NPLs, banks were more cautious. When you look at the rejection rate of uh, the loan applications, I think it increased to about 17% compared to 11% we had last year. So we saw maybe more rejections last year, and these are more rejections to a lower demand level. But it's not linked to liquidity. I think we have the banks have enough liquidity to extend loans if they have healthy uh, loan applications. Now, uh, of course, uh, the, the central bank here does abide to uh, Basel, Basel III to be more precise. But uh, some might argue that uh, the capital adequacy is, uh, well, at 15%, maybe it needs to even come lower. Because what you're saying is actually true. The banks are sitting on some very good liquidity. Maybe. The, the capital adequacy needs to be cut down, uh, just maybe maybe, maybe uh, 300 basis points and maybe more lending. W what do you say to this school of thought, the Trump school of thought? I, I don't think it's, it's, it's the issues, the capital adequacy requirements being at 15% because over the past, uh, let me continue using the five years, we've seen it way above 20%. In fact, I think the lowest we've had at the industry level is at 21% by end of June this year. So despite the fact that the prudential requirement is 15%, banks prefer to have comfortable uh, capital levels that allows them to take on risks. Because if you don't have enough buffer, you won't take on risks. And if you don't take on risks, of course, you won't improve your, your profitability. So having a strong capital base allows them to take on business that at the end of the day will uh, allow them to, to, to to make profitability. Again, if you have a strong capital base, you are able to, you don't rush to take on expensive uh, depots uh, as well. So they're able to manage their, 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 their financing. So, uh, and uh, then the lending, they're able to take on bigger projects that can support the, the profitability of the bank. So to date, we don't really see uh, big problems. And in fact, the lowest we've had banks going is around 18%. None of them has gone below 18%. Right. Uh, if uh, we were to go on to uh, the asset quality, you did touch the uh, NPLs, maybe from 7% to where they are right now, just above 8%. And uh, th th this begs the question, uh, need we be having more uh, monitoring, maybe evaluation of the banks at, uh, at, and stress tests maybe? Uh, maybe that's overkill, but uh, the, the NPL is definitely climbing up uh, from um, year on year. Yeah, sure. As we, again, as we expressed in our policy statement, we, we think more can be done from the bank side in terms of uh, assessing the quality of the loans before they approve them, and then following up the implementation of these uh, projects. Because when you look at the big projects that have had problems, it's one is uh, maybe the project preparation wasn't good, uh, and then in terms of implementation, you see problems that led to project failure. So it's around those two main problems, and we think uh, banks working closer with the, the borrowers, uh, they would improve on the quality of the portfolio as well. There might be other factors. Uh, slowing down of the economy, of course, at times affects the, uh, some of the projects, but mainly those were the main two 
reasons behind this worsening of the NPRs. Uh, the other issue maybe is uh, the, the pension uh, bodies uh, because uh, it was made very clear that uh, maybe uh, the market would be opened up for a private uh, body to actually come in. Uh, how far are we on this particular front? We have many that have showed up. Uh, I think already a number have been licensed to, to carry out private pension business. We had already uh, voluntary pension schemes across different institutions and uh, most of them now allegorizing these pension schemes under the new law, but they are also completely private uh, firms coming in to offer this business of uh, uh, managing pension schemes for private people. And so, yeah, I think by the end of this year, we should have more than 10 registered and start doing business in the market. Uh, going back to the banks, uh the expansion of assets by the banks, we have seen this uh, maybe uh, slow down from uh, close to 20% uh, uh, seven years ago to where it is right now at 14% uh, just last year. Uh, what is this signaling? Is there a need to worry about this particular? Uh no, 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 no. I, I think one, the growth has been really high. Uh, the 20s is, it was also linked to the booming economy. And uh, so slowing down to 14% is still high, so it's, it's not anything that would worry about showing any, any weaknesses in the banking sector. Uh, that could be linked really to the slowdown in the lending, as I said, uh, because the big chunk of the assets of our banks is really in loans to the private sector, almost more than 50% of the assets is, is, is a loan, so that's why you see slowdown in, uh, in the asset growth as well. Uh, and uh, so, I'd, I'd, as I say, it's we s again the, the, the simple statement we make is that the sector is sound, strong, and solid, and so remains profitable. It can be more profitable because to that uh, return to equity of around 11 percent is still low, but it's been growing, and we are happy with the progress. Maybe sound strong and uh, very solid is a sentiment that the Egyptians and the Moroccans do share because we've seen a lot of interest from Moroccans in Bank of Kigali uh, and um, among other banks. But uh, how hard is it for you to actually uh, evaluate some of this interest as a regulator? Because definitely you have to look into this. We did see uh, Crane Bank uh, have some issues in Uganda, but uh, not particularly here. How hard is it for you to actually uh, evaluate some of these uh, potential uh, moves and mergers and acquisitions? Uh, at least from your end, from your very uh, tough desk? No, I, I think one is we, we do proper background check of any prospective investor, investor in this market. And so we, we check, we work with their uh, home uh, regulators and we, so before we approve any takeover, we, we've really done our own uh, background check. And again, we immediately establish their Territories like Kenya, Nigeria, where we've already had banks operating here, we already have MOUs with the, the regulators of these uh, institution, institutions, and we normally have what we call uh, regulatory colleges working together to look at the entire group. And so it's something that is really helping to, to, to manage cross border risks uh, with these subsidies, with banks having uh, subsidies in different countries. So. I, I think we've, we've had different forums that bring us together as central bank governors for, for the continent and main issues we discuss is how we work together to ensure stability of these uh, cross-border banks. And, uh, and I think even what, as the example you gave of Kren Bank, I think the, the relationship we had with the Bank of Uganda that we were informed before they took action allowed us to protect Kren Bank Rwanda from any uh, uh, unnecessary run on its uh, depots and that allowed us to stabilize the bank until they're able to to sell it to another investor so it's it's very key that we are working together as regulators and uh, we are comf comfortable that we don't allow anybody to come in when we are not confident that they are going to be good players in the market if uh, we're maybe uh, to stay on that particular topic, uh, the East Africa Monetary Policy uh, Framework, uh, very interesting uh, ideals uh, that were set out there. But uh, ultimately, yes, talk of an East African currency. Uh, I always ask you this question, but uh, how, how is this progress coming on? How, how, how are we close to this? 
as the general general uh, implementation of the East African community, uh, deepening is a bit slower than we had all wished it to be. Uh, I think the monetary union would come in place only if the common market or the, the, the yes the common market at least is the common market protocol is fully implemented. Removing all the barriers to movement of capital, movement of labor, movement of uh, goods. If that is really implemented, that makes it smooth for the monetary union to come in place. So we keep focused on applying this as, as central bank governors. As you know, we, we normally meet minimum once a year, and uh, we have committees that continue working together to harmonize our big and regulatory framework within the financial sector, harmonize our monetary policy framework. So we are harmonizing what we are doing across the region and really preparing the ground for uh, uh, integration going forward. We, we are waiting for the Monetary Institute to be put in place. We hope uh, the, it, it has taken time to go through the approval processes of the ESC organs. Uh, so we hope maybe by latest next year we'll have this up and running so that it will help us to expedite the coordination of all these uh, harmonization processes we are, we are carrying on. So I would say we are still confident that come 2024 we should be in position to talk of a uh, single currency and a single central bank. Is this really achievable? I, I think the protocol provides for one what we call the uh, the criteria for us to move to this monetary union uh, and we the protocol provides that if few of the countries are ready to move we can start with all that are ready so out of six if we have four that are ready uh, I think by then we are five and I think to have provided that if three are ready they can move and the other would join later so as it stands today I think the other four countries are really on the right track. Uh, the two have their own political and uh, security problems that have really pulled back their economies. And so we still have maybe uh, some seven years to go. We hope maybe within that time they should have stabilized and moved on with others. And uh, so if not, and the other four are ready, I think they should be able to to move and form the monetary union and then welcome the others as and when they are ready.